I wouldn't say Albert Einstein was an alchemist, but Samael Aumveor called him a genius. And now they are questioning him, saying that they found some nutrients that are not in the in the center of the atomic of the atomic uh, particle. Those nutrients are outside, and maybe they are non nutrients. Samael speaks about free free electrons, and they discovered that these nutrients are faster than the speed of light. We can travel through the universe and be in another planet instead of hundred years. We can be there in a few minutes using the hyperspace. Thank you for downloading this podcast. My name is Richard Rootcroft. You're listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is lecture number 18. Science will become more like religion, and religion will become more like science. My guest today is Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. The title of this lecture is Science Will Become More and More Religious, and Religion Will Become More and More Scientific. Does it make sense? You know, many people would say this is absolutely crazy. But we are telling you that we have a strong way of revalidating this perception that science will become more and more religious and religion will become more and more scientific. For example, you know, Albert Einstein considered the father, the second father of physics. He used to say to his students, science without religion lames. Religion without science is blind. So you see, so Gnostic anthropology, founded by Samael on the Or, does agree completely with Albert Einstein regarding this. He was a scientist and also he was a religious man. Michel de Nostradamus, he was an alchemist and he was a doctor in medicine and he predicted the future of humanity. Also, he predicted the death of the king of France. And because of that, he went to jail, you know. And the queen, after her husband passed away, she released Michel de Nostradamus from prison because what he did, he just saw the future. The king of France had an accident. He was practicing those sports at that time, you know, riding a horse with his armor, fighting or competing with other people in the same position with those spears, but the spear mysteriously hit his head and entered into one of his eyes and of course affected the brain and the king passed away. And Michel de Nostradamus could see what was going to happen. As an alchemist, he practiced alchemy and Kabbalah, that we'll ex we will explain it at the end of this lecture, the mystery of alchemy, which is an ancient, ancient science, and Kabbalah is the same thing, but it's also alchemy is a religious science, it's a mystical science, and Kabbalah is the same. So what about Newton? Newton, the first father of physics, he was also an alchemist. And look at what he did for humanity, you know, for science, for the scientific field. He discovered the law of gravity and also the movement of the planets going out from the center the centrifugal force, and also how everything returns to the beginning, the centripetal force. As we said it in other lectures, he was the first one who discovered evolution and involution. And that ex that's exactly what happens with our own particles in our organism. Our particles move out, they expand, and other particles return to the beginning because they are dying. So. You know, this is a combination of science and also a mystical perception of the universe connected with cosmic laws and where the divinity is always present there. Michelangelo was another alchemist who connected religion, philosophy, the arts with science. He was, he created many, many scientific elements, you know, uh, we could say he discovered certain things and 
he was exploring how to create an airplane at that time, at his time, and people were impressed, very much impressed at his time. But also when he painted, all his paints have been considered, you know, incredible, powerful, mystical, you know, mystical creations. And sometimes they seem to be alive, you know. This is also a connection between science and religion. And to make the story shorter, you know, the Bible and all sacred books from the Jewish religion and all other religions, they are all written in a codified language. As long as they were written by the founders or their the disciples, their close disciples. And that codified, those two codified languages are, again, alchemy and Kabbalah. So alchemy and Kabbalah are described at the beginning of the Bible. You see, in the book of Genesis, remember there are two trees in paradise, Eden, and those two trees are connected underground through their roots. And one of the trees is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the other one is called the, true, the tree of life. And most of people, you know, cannot explain that. In reality, the first tree, the tree of knowledge, represents alchemy. And the second tree, the tree of life, is Kabbalah. In a few words, alchemy is the study, deeper and deeper, of matter transforming into a spirit. Can we understand that? It's very hard to understand. So in a few words, let's say, spiritualizing matter, using a very advanced knowledge of the laws of the universe. And what's Kabbalah? We could say is the opposite. Is the spirit descending into matter or crystallizing the spirit so we can create a fusion between spirit and matter? And this is exactly, listen to my words carefully, please. This is the mystery of resurrection. This is what the Christ, Jesus Christ, did. He crystallized his spirit after he had spiritualized his matter. And all founders of all religions realized the same cosmic event within themselves, which is a completely scientific, scientific, you know, reality. And all religions speak about that without describing clearly what they mean. And this is a tremendous, tremendous possibility for everyone which is uh, normally they call the Christ the perfect son. When people invoke the divinity, they speak about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the Son represents the cosmic Christ. And all religions, in past lecture we, we explained that, all religions describe the cosmic Christ. So Jesus incarnated the cosmic Christ. Moses did the same. Buddha did the same. Krishna did it also. Mohammed did it. Quetzalcoatl in ancient Mexico, Huiracocha in ancient Peru, the Incas, Hermes Trismegistos in ancient Egypt, and Zoroaster in ancient Iraq, Iran. All founders of all religions that we can remember, they all were capable of crystallizing their spirit to produce a fusion with their own matter, and they spiritualized their matter. So, Matter ascended into the level of a spirit, and the spirit descended into the level of matter. And that future was possible. So to give you a little hint, let's try to do something. The fire and water represent God. God is coming from Latin Deus. That means in Spanish, two or dos. So a spirit and matter is God. The fire and the water, which are fundamental elements of nature, you see? So the spirit, light, descended from the absolute and crystallized into fire and water. So the spirit, the universal spirit of life, created the universe made of fire and water. So fire, we could say the masculine aspect, water the feminine aspect. Let's say if we boil the water, listen to this carefully, let's be inspired a little bit. Let's use our imagination a little bit. And let's try to become also intuitive to perceive what we are trying to say. If we boil the water to 100 degrees, because we are made of water, if we learn how to do that, 
we boil the water, the water will become steam, and the steam later will release lightning bolts. This is exactly what Mother Nature does. You know, the sun transformed the ocean and the lakes and the rivers into steam, and they become clouds. And later those clouds will release thunders and also rays descending from the clouds, lightning bolts. And that's exactly what we can do with ourselves. So we can spiritualize matter and we can crystallize our own spirit. So we won't go any further, but eventually in the future, we'll be able to give you more and more information about this. So what about Beethoven and Mozart? These people were also alchemists. They practiced alchemy. alchemy. They knew how to transform their water into steam and also how to make their own spirit descend to amalgamate with matter, with their own matter. This is why they became geniuses. You know, Beethoven and Mozart, if we listen to their music, if we use that music in, in a, at your home, you see, that majestic music is already proven can make interior plants to grow beautifully, stronger and healthier. If you use that music in hospitals, there is scientific, you know, testing about that. That music is already proven can heal many kind of illnesses and among, amongst them, mental illnesses. What about the music, the same music being played in farms? It's already proven that chickens, when they listen to the music, their eggs become stronger, more beautiful. What about cows in a farm? Well, it's already also proven that their milk is also stronger and healthier. So this is something that we will have to explore together within the next few lectures to understand that all powers of the universe are within each one of us. We don't let anybody outside. People who are acting wrong today, a wrong lifestyle, they have the chance to change and to learn this kind of knowledge, learning to understand that science and religion should never be divided, should never be, you see, divorced. And the, the main mistake has come from religious fanatics individuals who scared people who were sincerious, you know, explorers of the truth. And those people decided to stay away from religious institutions because these people were too much to be tolerated. And even Jesus Christ has accused them of wrongdoing when he called religious fanatics of Pharisees. Who is a Pharisee? The one who prays louder to be noticed to be considered better than other people. But he said, whitened sepulchres in the cemeteries, whitened outside and rotten inside. That's a religious fanatic individual who creates more trouble than anything else. They pretend to be saints, but they are not. And their trouble is they only believe in the divinity and they believe it's okay to believe when the real meaning of faith is to know you will learn to know the divinity. You will learn to establish a relationship with the divinity. We don't need to believe anymore because we're learning to know the divinity. Learning to know. Gnosis means knowledge, knowing from moment to moment. So, and what about the other people, atheist people? You know, many people become atheists because they are fed up with fanatic religious individuals and also with the corruption of some priests, you know, people who commit all kind of atrocities sometimes. But an atheist, listen to this, is a person who also believes that the divinity has no reality. So again, they cannot prove it and they will never be able to prove it because the divinity is more real than we are. We are a little piece of the divinity. We are a little piece of the universal spirit of life. And we are a little piece of the universe. We are a little piece of matter of the universe. So God is within. We are all children of the divinity. Now, so the trouble is atheists should stop 
being afraid of religious fanatics, individuals, and to make a step further into exploring religion. Study it, study it. Especially those scientific individuals, you know, who are very proud of their PhDs. We invite you all to enter into these studies. Because if you are a true scientific individual, you shouldn't ignore any possibility. You shouldn't deny any possibility of being explored. Do that. Study Gnostic books, Gnostic anthropological books. There are 70 books translated into many languages right now. And let's see what happens. Same thing with fanatic religious individuals. Stop being fanatic. Stop telling lies to yourselves. Learn to be a serious religious individual and also accept science as a very important part of knowledge of the universe. If you are a serious religious individual, when you study the Bible, for example, the first book of the Bible, alchemy, you know, is there. It's the first tree, the tree of knowledge. But study it. Go into the books of Gnostic anthropology and discover it. Rediscover the knowledge that you've been ignoring because your sacred book is written in a codified language by angels, by superior beings. And this is for all religions. So, in a few words, you know, Gnostic anthropology is unveiling the ignorance of our entire human race. People with PhDs or people who don't know how to read and write. Most of people commit the same mistake. Not only we don't know, but we don't know that we don't know. This is what Socrates used to say, we ignore that we ignore. For example, do we know how to eat? Most of people don't know how to eat. Do we know how to drink with moderation and also eating in a balanced manner? The trouble is when there is too much poverty in the world, you know, some people cannot even eat every day. And this is a real tragedy. We always say in Gnostic anthropology that poverty is evil. So we should also contribute to eliminate poverty on the face of the earth, because that's a big mistake that we have committed the entire human race. You know, we have created an unjust society, an unjust humanity. How can we call ourselves humanity? It means that we are all humans when we are not. Homo sapiens, it means human with knowledge, with wisdom. What do we really know? What about society? We are not even partners, you know. Most of people are not partners. Just a few share the worth of the economy of the world. And the rest, you know, they don't. So, again, we don't know how to eat, we don't know how to drink, and we don't know how to keep fit, healthy, stronger. But, of course, this is very important to be developed in a society that functions properly. Number two, do we know how to breathe? Do you know that breathing is food for our blood system, the bloodstream? When we breathe through pranayamas, and we use the entire lungs system, you see, our blood becomes healthier, stronger. And remember, the blood travels through the entire organism. And the blood is also connected with our soul, is connected with our ancestors, and is also connected with our descendants, our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our grandparents. So learning to breathe is a must. Why do people are under stress because they don't breathe properly. We use only the upper part of our lungs when we should be able to use the entire, the complete two lungs. We should learn to breathe the way babies do it, when their stomach is up and down because they are using their lungs completely. Do we know how to do that? If we don't, we recommend that the time has come to do it. Number three, do we know how to think? Oh, everybody is convinced that we all know how to think, you know, especially the scientific community or the business community. We, we talk about logic. Let me tell you this. What we call thinking is the lowest of the lowest within the intellectual capabilities. The, the so-called IQ is not real. <laughs> it's, not, it's a twisted perception of reality. You see, we, we, we ignore that within our mind we have a superior capability called inspiration, 
connected with our pineal gland. And our pineal gland is also connected with our creative willpower. You see? So if I want to think right to become positive, positive thinking, if I want to make also the right decisions, I have to learn to be inspired first. So I have to learn to use my superior intellect. What about imagination? Creative imagination is also an aspect of our superior intellect. The trouble is most of people make fun of imagination. Oh, you are, this is only your imagination. It means that you're wrong. But in reality, there are two kinds of imagination. Creative imagination, which is the same, the same clairvoyance that Mr. Michel de Nostradamus had developed. He could see not only what could happen in, in other planets where there is life or there is no or a different kind of life. He could also see the past and also see the future because he knew how to travel within the parallel universes consciously. And past, present and future become one within the superior dimensions of space. So creative imagination is a superior sense that we all have it connected with our pituitary gland. The problem is we don't know how to do it. But in Gnostic anthropology, we teach people how to do it. So the so-called process of thinking in esoteric language, it is called, not only by Gnostic students, many schools of esoteric studies call it the donkey. What's a donkey? It's an animal, strong, stubborn, and stupid. So what we call thinking is just what? The struggle of the antithesis. So if the thesis is wrong, the synthesis will be also wrong. The thesis is struggling against the antithesis to find the synthesis. You see the point? So this is why when scientific laboratories are making new products, medicine, why do they have to replace their medicine every three to five years? Because they are just thinking. They don't use their inspiration. Then they don't use their creative imagination. They just think. It's like a lottery ticket. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's experience, okay? So at the end, you know, we're telling lies to ourselves and telling lies to the world and selling a product which is not right, which is not good, because it doesn't really cure, you see? So this is very important to be comprehended. We don't know how to think. And also, also, you see, right now, right now, why people are more and more aware that we have also an emotional intelligence? Because in one of our lectures, we described that we have three brains, an intellectual brain, an emotional brain, and also a motor brain. So if we learn how to use the three brains in a balanced manner, we'll be able to live longer, to become more intelligent, to become more creative, and to have a superior kind of life. So we recommend that you listen to that lecture, The Three Brains and the New Biology. And also, who created logic? Who developed that concept of logic? Wasn't it in ancient Greece? Aristoteles. Well, Mr. Aristoteles was right at his time, but you know, he lived before Jesus Christ. So the process of thinking was needed at that time. Do you know why? Because humanity at that time was very physical very instinctive. There was a time when people practiced a lot of sports and people went to the battlefield with tremendous physical strength. They carried swords, they carried spears, and the battles were body-to-body -body combat. So people were very instinctive. So that was the time to give humanity a better alternative to combine instinct also with some kind of intellectuality. So intellect was developed. But today, today, and listen to my words carefully, today emotional intelligence is given to humanity through many, many sources. The universe, cosmic intelligence, cosmic consciousness, the cosmic Christ is given the entire human race a better alternative because the process of thinking has been exhausted. Look at the world. Isn't it the world upside down? 
isn't it that our leaders in different fields, politics, economics, armies, you know, the military, <laughs> what's happening today? We have destroyed the economy of the world. Don't we realize that we are in a big trouble? A big trouble where two political systems are really collapsing. They haven't been able to solve the troubles of the world, you know, capitalism and also communism. Both systems have proven to be a failure. Something is wrong, you know, something is really wrong. So the time has come now to develop our natural wisdom, to connect better with the universe, with superior forces, superior cosmic intelligences, and to learn to grow psychologically. So this is why also according to Gnostic cosmology, described by Samael Anver, our entire solar system is traveling within the galaxy. And now we entered within the Aquarian constellation. So this is then the Aquarian age. And the Aquarian age is founded, and listen to this, and please remember my words. The Aquarian age is founded on the awakening of emotional intelligence, which is founded also within intuition. And intuition is purely emotional intelligence. Intuition is coming from the heart, is coming from emotional intelligence, is we could say is a different kind of language, is the divinity talking to us. The universe is telling us through our heart. It's a feeling, it's not a thought. So if we learn to use our superior intellect, our inspiration, if we learn to use our creative imagination, also superior intellect, and also we learn to use our superior emotional capability called intuition, this is the path that will get us closer into transforming into real human beings, into real homo sapiens. Because today, unfortunately, we are just intellectual animals. So then, do we know how to think? Of course we don't. Only when we ask the universe through inspiration, through creative imagination, and through superior emotional intelligence or intuition, then we can think. And our thoughts will become mathematically correct. You know, do you see the difference? So the time has come to learn to think. Now, do we know how to meditate? Number four, what's meditation? You know, many schools of esoteric, esotericism teach that the higher way of thinking is to stop thinking. What is that? That's meditation. So meditation means to establish a relationship with the divinity, to establish a relationship with the universe, with cosmic intelligence. So it's not only praying, it's more than praying. Praying, we need to learn to pray, of course, asking for help to the divinity. But meditation means after we ask, then we should learn to listen to what the divinity is teaching us. Our cosmic divine father, cosmic divine mother that live within ourselves should be consulted before we make a decision. So meditation also will expand our capabilities because we will learn to know ourselves better and better and better. We will stop being intellectual animals and we'll be, we'll be learning to become true human beings, complete, more and more complete human beings. We're supposed to have 12 senses instead of five. What are the other seven senses? The other seven senses are connected with the seven endocrine glands that we described in a past lecture. Number five, and I'm going to complete my ideas with this point number five, based on Gnostic anthropology. Do we know how to make love? You know, isn't it like becoming maybe too aggressive regarding our privacy? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But do we know that learning to make love is extremely, extremely important? And this is also connected with the two trees, the two trees, Eden, the two trees on paradise, which are the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the tree of life. If we don't know how to make love, 
with love, we will never be able to ascend into a superior stage of consciousness. We would never be able to crystallize our own spirit, to melt with our organism, with our matter, and we won't be able to spiritualize our organisms, our matter, to produce a fusion with the spirit. This is extremely important. If you want to do your own research, we invite you to go into Leviticus, Leviticus, the book of Leviticus in the Bible, the Old Testament, and please study there number 15 to number 18. There is very clearly explained what should be done and with what we shouldn't be done. So please accept my invitation. I'm asking you respectfully. So if we don't know how to eat, drink, and to keep fit, if we don't know how to breathe, if we don't know how to think, if we don't know how to meditate, if we don't know how to make love, do you see our clear limitations? The Gnostic, Gnostic anthropology will be able to teach us. It's a more complete picture of reality based on science and religion. So science will become more and more religious and religion will become more and more scientific. So again, spirit and matter are within ourselves and we have to learn to produce a fusion within spirit and matter within ourselves. You know, when we study a molecule of water, okay, so what's inside of that molecule of water? It's uh, two particles of hydrogen and one of oxygen. Hydrogen yes. and one of oxygen. Mm. So we write it down, you know, H2O. And so we could say that hydrogen is a masculine force and oxygen is a feminine force. A man and a woman, and when they connect sexually, they create the third force which is water. So water is the baby, is the result, the third force. But you know, in this formula, there is something missing, and this is very, very important. This is why science is really very much disconnected from the inner reality of the universe. What do I mean with that? If you try to create a molecule of water in a laboratory, you can do it. Okay, you put hydrogen, two particles and one particle of oxygen, and you say, this is water. Is it really water? No, it's not. Why not? Because there is something missing. What is missing? The element fire. The spirit is not there. And you cannot create fire out of nothing, because the fire has always been, will always be. It's the crystallization of light. The spirit has always been, will always be. And this is who we really are. We are a spiritual beings. We have a body, we have a mind, we have a soul. They are vehicles. So matter are the vehicles of the spirit. But of course there is an inner connection amongst them. We need both to ascend into higher levels of cosmic intelligence, cosmic consciousness, cosmic wisdom, cosmic loving capability. So this is why, you know, and this is very, very important to be comprehended. Can I ask you a couple of questions? You know the teachings of Samuel and they're better than anybody I know, okay? When, in an early podcast on Gnostic lectures, you said that the atom was of the mental plane, okay? I had a lot of trouble with that originally. Now, now I'm more comfortable with it because I've looked into it a little bit and it seems to be supported uh, scientifically, okay? But what about the other aspect? We were saying that the molecular, um, uh, how do I put this correctly, the molecules, what did Samuel say about molecules? That is emotional, right? Yeah, basically, you know, it, let, me, let me try to describe something. Okay, what's an emotion and what's a thought? Emotion is feeling life, feeling reality. What's a thought? A thought is, we could say, when you experience an emotion, you can create out of that emotion hundreds and even thousands of different thoughts. For example, we cry, okay. Why are we crying? Out of joy, out of sadness, out of fear, etc. Well, 
then after you experience the emotional waves, let's speak about the waves. You experience the emotional waves, which is our perception of reality, perception of life, perception of the universe. You see, we feel, but then after that, we think. So the process of thinking is a translation of previous perceptions. You see, this is why we could say emotions are faster than thinking. But it uh, doesn't sound my own very say that uh, the emotional world of molecules is the fifth dimension, which is the astral dimension. Yeah, both, both are the fifth dimension, emotions and thoughts. And they're, they're penetrating and interpenetrating us all the time anyway. It's not like yeah. when we're awake, these dimensions go away. They're still there, right? That's correct. You know, this is why, you know, uh, I didn't mention in my lecture another aspect of emotional intelligence, which is telepathy. Telepathy is a, is a connection between emotions and thoughts. This is what we call the gut feeling. When you, when you feel something in your stomach, in your solar plexus, and suddenly you visualize something, it means that a person that I know, or maybe somebody I don't know, is feeling me, is sending me its presence to me, or vice versa. So that is an emotional connection in the molecular universe. So, and this is why it happens a lot that you feel the presence of someone and the person calls you on the phone. Or maybe you meet the person at the corner of the street where you're walking and you cannot believe it. You say, oh, I was just thinking in you. No, thinking is incomplete to be said. You know, in reality, we felt the presence of the other person simultaneously while the other person was feeling us. That's an emotional connection that is manifested in our solar plexus, actually to be more specific in our pancreas, in our pa so it doesn't, that's a language by itself. And this is the language we speak in those parallel universes. But this is using the pancreas and the solar plex and the heart as a scientific instrument to find out about the universe, right? Yeah, but uh, allow me to complete the idea. So after, after I feel from my solar plexus, the gut feeling, it could be a good feeling or a bad feeling. Maybe I'm feeling the presence of danger. Of danger. Maybe somebody is coming to kill me at the corner of the street, you see? And if I am sensitive enough, I will perceive the negative evil presence. Maybe I'm going to be assaulted in the middle of the night, you see? So if I am sensitive enough, if I learn how to awaken my superior senses, in this case, telepathy, I'll be able to feel either a positive feeling or a negative feeling. And after, from there, from the pancreas, because the pancreas is one of the endocrine glands, we send at an incredible speed into my brain. And this is why I can visualize through my pituitary gland, I visualize this is clairvoyance or creative imagination. And then, then I send that after I visualize after, before I feel, I visualize, and I transform into thoughts now. So the thoughts are a transformation of previous emotions, previous feelings. You see, could be instinctive, could be sexual, instinctive, or emotional. So thought is just a translation of previous perceptions. You but, see, but how does that relate to the astral plane? You go to sleep and you may or may not remember being in the astral plane, but your physical body is sleeping on the bed. Now you're talking about what we typically call the fifth dimension. Yeah, you know, you know what happened is that on Earth we speak so many languages. Yeah. How many languages? Hundreds and hundreds of languages. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the astral universe, you meet people that maybe speak a different language than yours, but do you... Don't you feel that you can communicate with them without any problem? Some, sometimes unknown people. And because we're speaking an emotional language. This is the telepathic connection with other people. So it's a different kind of language, telepathic language. And after that, <laughs> when we send it into the brain, we translate that into the language that we speak normally, that we communicate with other people. And this is why people say, oh, I was thinking in you. In reality, I was also thinking, but before I thought, I felt your presence first. And then 
an electrical connection sent from my pancreas, one of my endocrine glands, into my pituitary gland, into my brain, to develop, it was like a screen on my mind. I could see the person, I could visualize the environment that surrounding that person, and after that, I translated into words, according to the language that, that I speak. You see, and this is why I normally tell other people on the phone, oh, I was just thinking of you, and you phoned me. So it's incredible, you know, that, that kind of, we all have it unconsciously. So basically, in the fifth dimension, we have the astral universe, and also we have the mental universe. The mental is more refined, you know, because it's atomic. But the, mole the molecular universe is the astral, or, you know, we, can, we could say it's connected with emotions. Okay, the question. Yes. What about cellular? Now, Samuel said, what's cellular? Yeah, the cells, the cell without the ether, you know, this is very important to be comprehended. If the cells were not supported by an etheric nature that we all carry within, which is an el electromagnetic field. So that's the vital plane, right? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, so the cell wouldn't be alive without the vital plane. So this is why we have a body. And Russian scientists discovered that Krill a long time ago. Krillian photography, yeah. That, that's yeah. correct. And they discover a body, they bapt baptize that body as the bioplastic, oh, yeah. the bioplastic body. And in esoteric language, people call it the etheric body or the vital body. So every particle of ether interpenetrates every cell, every particle of our cell constitution, cellular constitution. So this is why when we are sick, it's because the aesthetic nature is ill. And this is why we need to reinforce that electromagnetic field, which is connected with the, the immune system. Yeah. Okay, so the way the universe is constructed, the physical body, um, from that we find the vital body, the astral body, the mental body, the causal body, the butic body, and beyond that, probably the logos, right? That's the way the universe is constructed. Yeah, that's correct. So essentially, you know, the, the electrons, but, the, the electronic body is our soul. But that electronic body has to be built, has to be created, has to be developed. So Walter Russell's wave was predominantly in the mental plane. I don't think much of his work went into the causal or butic realm at all. His universal one is the logos. The same yeah, thing, right? That's correct. We share the spirit. Yeah. And the spirit has three different levels of manifestation. Basically, we are inviting you all to study Gnostic books, you know, through uh, GnosticTeachings.org. You can find all kind of books written by Samaylon Vehor. And also to keep in touch with us, you know, it will be a pleasure to establish a relationship with, you know, the entire human race because... We are part of a huge, gigantic family. And our duty is to learn to respect, to learn to learn from each other, and to learn to even love each other, you know, as a, as a family. Because love, real love, is consciousness itself, is wisdom itself. The highest way of wisdom is love, learning to love. You know, if we're all searching for the truth sincerely, Sooner or later, we get together. We will meet each other because our objective is also connected with the purpose of being alive. We are here for a higher purpose. We are learning to awaken our consciousness, to create our soul. Because our soul can, when we do that, we can connect with the cosmic, cosmic consciousness, which is the consciousness of the Christ. Where there is more light, there is more consciousness. And this is exactly what we have to learn to do, you know. The process, what we call illumination. Illumination. But most people don't even know that there is such a thing as ascending or descending or illumination. They just go about their lives normally. They don't have any knowledge that they're, they're supposed to be ascending, right? Yeah, this is why it's important to, be, to mention that, you know, because... Uh, then it's a new maybe approach into reality that we shouldn't ignore because where there is more light in the universe, there is more consciousness, there is more cosmic intelligence. 
every sun is alive. It's a living, gigantic organism. The same way our planet Earth is alive. Well, so, th this goes along with Walter Russell. He says if there's a planet rotating around a sun, and for any reason something comes into that solar system, that the orbit of the planet or all of the planets will change to balance that system. And the only way that could happen is if each body has knowledge of all the other bodies. So there, there, there's your uh, communication of information because every particle in existence seems to already know what every other particle is doing. Yeah, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. you know, Samuel Anveur mentioned that every solar system corresponds to a molecule within the universe, within the galaxy. So the galaxy is a gigantic living organism. Recently, scientists discovered a planet outside of our solar system, of course, that belongs to a system where there are two suns. Do you hear that? There was a movie, Star Wars, that was made a few years ago. And that movie, as a science, as a science fiction, you know, projection of the, of the imagination of a writer, mentioned that possibility. One planet moving around two suns, two different stars. Now scientists discovered that. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it incredible? So science fiction is now becoming a reality. Well, science fiction writers, every science fiction book was written by a human being and that human being has access to cosmic knowledge. All ideas are cosmic. Yeah. So you could say that all oh, these Gnostic people, they're just uh, borrowing from science fiction. No, I, I think we're all of the same idea. The ideas are out there already, right? Maybe the other way around, you know, <laughs> the other way around, because uh, Albert, Albert Einstein used to say, everything we can imagine in the universe is because it has reality. You have been listening to Gnostic Lectures. This is lecture number 18. Science will become more like religion, and religion will become more like science. My host today was Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. The website is rickyradio.com. Thank you very much, uh, Rick, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. And thank you to our audiences listening to us.